you see the, the red little red report icon. Yeah. So now if we get to the computer, that's what I have been doing. Um, okay. Let's not forget our microphone. Yep. Okay, so wait for the call to come, hit send computer, and we should mm -hmm. be good. Okay. And if I ever want to record someone without a presentation, leave it on for leave professor, professor camera, and, turn the lights off. And you just up. don't have to send computer. It just has a, a blank screen up there. Okay, that's perfect. Do you mind wearing the microphone? No, I it's helpful. Yeah. It's possible to turn on the assess lighting instead of I was looking at that. I'm going to have to have somebody else look at it. Okay. Probably facilities as well, because okay. whenever we try to control it, it doesn't do anything. Oh, okay. So I, I need to dig into some of the things. It's just like the e-cloud. Like, 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 like,
Just like that. bachelor's and master's degree at Ohio State uh, for uh, moving down south to NC State to conduct a PhD research. Uh, Libby then worked as a postdoc for a little while before returning to Ohio State as an assistant professor uh, in zoology, which is now evolution ecology and organismal biology at Ohio State. Uh, Libby's currently a full professor at Ohio State. She's also served as chair of the department. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Libby's research in her lab, a lot of Libby's research has uh, gone into uh, understanding how species with specific life history adaptations that respond to environmental change. And she's used a wide diversity of field and lab and modeling studies to understand how organisms respond to changing environmental conditions. Uh, she's also worked a lot, as she's going to talk about today, on animal movement and understanding how the spatial structure of the environment influences animal movement and population success. Uh, so kind of a diversity of research questions. Uh, Libby's lab at Ohio State also has uh, a really unique relationship with Ohio DMR. A lot of the management questions, a lot of the questions that work on are management driven uh, on Lake Erie and also on the Ohio State Task Force who study the fish populations there. Um, so as I mentioned, today's Libby's, Libby's talk will work, uh, and the title of her talk is Species Dependent Consequences uh, to Barriers to Downstream Migration. Uh, so if you guys will join me in getting Libby and we'll talk. Thanks, Troy, and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I'm really enjoying myself so far. There's lots of interesting stuff going on here. I've never been to Clemson. Uh, I've, hard, I've driven through South Carolina, but despite spending many years in North Carolina, I've never really spent time here. So it was, it's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, when I got invited to give this seminar, I knew that I didn't want to talk about anything that I was working on in collaboration with Troy. <laughs> Because then I would say I, and he would be in the audience knowing that it was really him. And so I didn't want to do that. So that, that kind of meant that I wouldn't be talking about walleye or yellow perch in Lake Erie, which is, takes up um, a lot of my research these days. And I also decided that I wanted to use this as a good excuse to make myself put together a few pieces of research that I had been doing, but I had never realized how similar they were. So I found myself last year finishing up two projects that both happen to be about dams as barriers to movement, but I had never really thought about them in the same way because they're such different projects. And so I thought I could force myself to think of these in the same piece and maybe you know, draw some broader, more general conclusions. So I'm going to give you the punchline right now, get switch to the end here, that there are no broad general conclusions coming out of combining these two projects. But it has made me think very differently about it. It's made me kind of question some of my biases and some of my perceptions. And so um, I hope that you'll at least gain some information about two separate projects, why I think I should be thinking about them uh, in, you know, in a larger, broader picture, and then maybe how my perspective has changed. So I want to start by, let's see, yep, uh, crediting my collaborators. Uh, David Glover and Gary Allison are postdocs, we're postdocs. Uh, David's now at Illinois DNR. Keith Shane, my incredible master's student who's graduated now, who did the, uh, the stuff that I'm going to say I and we about on the first half of the talk. Agency biologists from Vermont and Ohio. And then my academic collaborators, uh, Donna Parrish and Martha Mather, who are in co-op units at Vermont and Kansas State. OK. <laughs> Sorry about the squeaking. <laughs> um, so I don't think it's going to be too crazy of a, a thing to say that movement through rivers and streams has evolved as a part of the life cycle of many species of fish. So it has evolved for a variety of kinds of movement. So um, diadromy, which you know, is a life cycle that has a fresh water and a salt water phase. Um, this word that I never know how to pronounce, which is like the fresh water version of diadromy. It's just moving between a fresh water and a fresh water stage. Uh, habitat selection. So this may not have anything to do with seasonal life cycle. It may just be a fish is here. The good habitat is upstream. It needs to move through the stream or the river to get there. Density dependence, so fish that spawn in, in reds or nests, when the fish hatch, when the young hatch, um, they're in really high densities, and it's often a part of life cycle then to disperse at that point. And in that case, they need to be able to move through rivers and streams. 
So no matter what the motivation is for this movement through the rivers and streams, dams present a barrier. So if you don't study directly dams as barriers to, to fish movement, if you don't study fish movement in rivers, then, then you'll probably think about uh, the, this concept of dams as, to, as barriers to fish movement with the kind of classic example of, of salmon uh, moving upstream. OK, where is this? So this is supposedly a picture of a salmon jumping at this dam. And clearly, it's not, no matter how hard it tries, it's not going to make it. That dam is absolutely impassable to that salmon without some kind of assistance. And so dams have absolutely limited the upstream range, reduced the upstream range of populations in a variety of rivers across the world. So we respond to that by, by helping them. So no, there we go. So we do things like build fish ladders, uh, which kind of makes a ramp up the dam. Um, helicopters, collecting the fish below the dam, sticking them in a basket, helicoptering them above the dam, releasing them, trucking fish around the dam. And my favorite is the fish cannon. So fish are collected downstream, they're put into this thing, and it shoots them up this uh, tube to the other side of the dam. And if you've never seen it in action, you need to Google it, but not right now. <laughs> okay. OK, so I don't work on any of this stuff. I don't work on uh, any kinds of technologies or ideas that will get fish past dams. But this just goes to show what we have to do to solve these problems. So uh, a lot of people are surprised to learn or haven't realized that downstream passage of dams is also an issue. So this is a picture of uh, a dam at Turner's Falls on the Connecticut River. This is a little closer up view. And um, what you can see here is three ways of, for fish to pass this dam. So they can go through the fish, the fish can, uh, canal. They can go over the dam. They can go through the dam. Uh, and so this is not an absolute barrier to passage. It's not like that upstream big dam that that salmon was facing. It's not an absolute barrier. The problem is that as the fish approach the dam, these dams back up, especially on these big rivers, they back up the river for many kilometers behind it. And so these fish that are adapted to use flow, the strong unidirectional flow at the seasons in which they're migrating, as a cue for how to get through the river, they, they're swimming downstream and they encounter this reservoir. They encounter basically a lake. And uh, so they've lost the cue. So even though if they could get right here, they might be able to pass, the trick is getting them there. And uh, even if they can get there, it generally involves some kind of delay for them getting there. So downstream. Um, Downstream passage is an issue, just like upstream passage. And I'll be talking about downstream passage today. OK, so I, now I'm all, you know, all negative, right? Dams are a bad thing. But all dams as barriers can also be a positive thing. So this is a picture of Tappan Lake in Ohio. In Ohio, we don't have natural lakes. And so we've made a lot of lakes by damming up rivers. <clears throat> and unlike the, the dams that you have here on this enormous river, around here, um, we dam up creeks. And we make big lakes out of damming up creeks. We also dam up some larger rivers. But a lot of the, the lakes in Ohio are made from damming small creeks. And so the Ohio DNR stocks these with lake fish, with native lake fish and some non-native lake fish. And the goal is for those fish to stay to, to create a fishery in the lake, in the reservoir. They don't want these fish moving downstream past the dams. <clears throat> So what am I doing? <laughs> Let's try this again. OK, so why don't they want the fish moving on the stream? Which means past the dam. So what are the negative consequences? Um, their main concern is loss to the re reservoir fishery. They don't want to lose these fish out of there into the stream. Um, I'm also concerned about some other things. There's some ex extreme habitat difference between reservoir and the stream they're built on. There's these sensitive native communities downstream. So for instance, this is. Um, Hoover Reservoir. It's on the northeast part of Columbus. And this is Big Walnut Creek, which runs into and out of Hoover Reservoir. So Big Walnut Creek has this diverse 
It's shallow, it has a diverse freshwater mussel community, a diverse freshwater insect community, a diverse stream fish community, and Hoover Reservoir is a lake. It's a silty bottom lake. So the fish in there are, are not built for these streams, and these streams are not built for these big predators to come out of the dam and, and live or, or move through these streams. <laughs> so there's some other concerns besides just loss to the upstream fishery. There's also the gain to the downstream community that's a problem. Okay, so oh, then there's other thing. When they're stocking non-native fish, there's a potential for them expanding beyond the targeted stocking area. <clears throat> Okay, so we got both sides. We got the positive and the negative. And I found myself last year, despite that I've, I've studied both sides of this for years, but I never really thought about the fact that it's the same question. I'm thinking of dams as barriers to downstream migration of fish. In one case, I want them to be barriers. In the other case, I don't want them to be barriers. And in both cases, I sort of have this bias as, as a conservation biologist that you know, everything is bad, right? So in one case, it's not a strong enough barrier. In the other case, it's too strong a barrier. Okay, so the fish I've been studying this on are um, two species of anadromous fish, Atlantic salmon and American shad, and two species of freshwater fish, muscalunge and saugai. Okay, saugai is a hybrid between walleye and, and sauger. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Okay, and so in the Atlantic salmon and the American shad, I studied this in the, the young stages, or the juvenile stages, so the smolts, for Atlantic salmon and the larvae for American shad, and this is done through simulation modeling. For the muscles and saugai, um, I study that at the adults and the, the juveniles, but not the young juveniles. I think later in the talk I'll refer to them as subadults. And this is done through a field tagging study. Okay, so two, two things I have to comment on is actually, when I put this together, I realized I can't do all of this in one talk, so you will thank me. I'm not going to talk about the American Shad simulation model. I'm going to talk about the Atlantic Salmon model and the Musclunge and Saugai field study. And I also have to acknowledge that I understand that Saugai aren't actually a species, even though they're in the species column. They're a hybrid, uh, but I'm going to call them a species. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to talk about these two projects. This reservoir stock, musculature, and saugai. I want to ask questions about the drivers and the cohort consequences of downstream migration. And then I want to talk about the consequences of the migration delays for the Atlantic salmon smolts and the delays due to dams. Okay, so let's start with the Musculature and Saugai. So this is in Ohio. This is um, a project in collaboration with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Ohio Division of Wildlife. And as I was talking to the graduate students today, I, I kind of explained that, like, you know, the Ohio Division of Wildlife has these interests and needs in research, and I have these interests and skills in research, and, and we have this overlap. This, you know, I always think of life as a Venn diagram, so there's a Venn diagram, this, this intersection, and this happens to be one of these projects. And there's a couple of places in here that I, I hope I remember to say, like, this is the benefit I get from working with the Ohio Division of Wildlife, in addition to the, the funding that I get. So, um, so we've built all these lakes in Ohio, and uh, the Ohio Division of Wildlife uh, raises fish in the hatcheries to stock into the lakes, and they want a good return on their investment, right? It's a lot of money, and what they're trying to do is build a fishery. We have a really strong sport angling community in Ohio, and we're trying to build fisheries for them. It's for, it's for recreation. The musclunge in particular are expensive because they stay in the, the hatchery for a year and a half before they're stocked, almost a year and a half before they're stocked. They're only stocked into nine um, Ohio reservoirs right now. Uh, so that's a really expensive fish. We really want to keep them in the lake. Uh, Saugai, uh, the Division of Wildlife is most interested in keeping them in there to maintain the fishery. I also have some other concerns about Saugai moving downstream into these, into these small creeks. Okay, so our question is how many of these fish, uh, <coughs> these stock fish leave the reservoirs? Which ones leave? When do they leave? We're trying to find patterns in, in, in who's leaving and, and kind of what the motivation is. So then we can describe these patterns and the drivers of immigration, but then we have to ask, given that, is the number leaving actually enough to make a difference to the reservoir fishery? So this study is done in Allen Creek Lake. So the, the, the muscalunge are actually 
tagged in a number of other reservoirs, and uh, we also have them being detected at, at their downstream migration from another number of other reservoirs. For this, which is a study, the master study of Keith Shane, we wanted him to focus on this reservoir and do a really intensive study here. So this is Allen Creek Lake. I just showed you a picture of Hoover Reservoir. And so um, this is Columbus. And Columbus, in the, in the Midwest, everything goes north, south, east, west. Like, I'm really lost in Clemson because the roads just go all over the place. But, but here, even our rivers are really well behaved. And so Columbus has these four rivers that go from north to south through it. And, there's, and each river has a, a reservoir dam at the top of it, at, at the top of the city. So, so this is Allen Creek Lake. And it also runs into a small Allen Creek, right? It runs into a creek. It runs, you know, a creek forms this um, reservoir. And so we have the same issues there that we have in the, in the pictures I just showed you of Hoover. OK, so. Um, put three kinds of tags in and on the fish. Uh, acoustic transmitters went into a subset of the fish. Uh, we use these to track movement within the reservoir. I won't be showing you those data today, but those data have helped inform some decisions we made in the analysis that I will be showing you today. So there's lots of other stuff we're, we're doing with this particular study. And then pit tags were put in all of the fish that we sampled, and they're used to detect uh, movement downstream out of the reservoir. And then the saw guy also received external tags so that we could get fishermen uh, reporting uh, captures to us. Then downstream from the reservoir, we have this array of pit tag antennas. This is not a picture of Allen Creek. This is a picture from the brochure of the manufacturer. If I had a picture of Allen Creek below the reservoir, you wouldn't be able to see anything in the water because it's too turbid. So anyway, I have this array so that once the fish pass the dam, and, and uh, start moving out of the tailwaters, we detect them here. <clears throat> no, I got plants this way. OK, just requisite pictures of fish surgery and fish pit tags. Um, all right, so then we used electrofishing and fike nets to capture fish to tag. And when I say we here, I really mean uh, John, I think probably, right, John, did you do this? <laughs> uh, from 2016 to 2018, we had 48 capture and tagging day. So we want to make sure that we had we were continually adding fish to this population of tagged fish. So in the end, we had uh, about 2,900 saw guy that were pit tagged in this study. All, OK, this is okay. reason number one. I love working with the hydrogen of wildlife. So all the, pit, all the muscalines that have been stocked into these reservoirs since 2013 were tagged with a pit tag at stocking. So that turns into almost 23 muscalunge tags, having pit tags in them during the period of the study. So that's, that's a sample size that I could never imagine in a, in a tracking study before. OK, so the first thing Keith did was uh, develop a model, parameterize a model that accounted for all the losses and gains of the fish on a daily basis in our study system. So there's tagged fish, and there's tagged fish coming in you know, continuously at those 48 sample dates throughout the, and then also the stocking dates for the muscalunge throughout the study period. Uh, there's angler harvest, there's natural mortality, which he estimated from the model, and then the downstream migration, which we're estimating with pit tags. And the reason we, he needed to get this model first is because we, had, we want to estimate the probability or the proportion of fish that, that leave on any given day. And this denominator, that is the number of tagged fish in the population in the reservoir, is going to be changing on a daily basis due to these different losses and the, and the gains. And so we had to get a correct denominator for each day. All right, so right into what we saw. So this is for Sogai. These are dates from January through December. On the y-axis is a number of emigrants, a number of fish going downstream through the dam on each of those dates. And so um, about 13% of the tagged Sogai emigrated downstream during this study. All the emigrants, all the sagae were at least one year old, so those sub-adults were not emigrating. And most days have no emigrants, like most days are emigrants, and the emigration events were not random across states, right? There's this, there's these, you know, pile-ups of, of emigrants on, on certain dates or in certain ranges of dates. So when I first started studying downstream movement of this hybrid 
out of the reservoirs many years ago, I, I was getting this message about uh, fish being, sockeye being washed out of the reservoirs. And, and I think that people were thinking that because they would look in the tailwaters after big rain events and there would be a lot of sockeye in there. My view was that these sockeye are the, the progeny of two fish who deal with big river systems. And it's really unlikely that they're gonna get washed out of anywhere because of flow. But rather what might be happening is that they happen to be moving at certain seasons. Their motivation to move is seasonal. And it happens to be the seasons where we have lots of high discharge. So the first thing we wanted to do was look at, at, at discharge uh, relative to these movements. When we plot discharge on here, we see um, a couple of things. First of all, on any day where there's a, there's a lot of uh, sawguy movement out of the reservoir, there's high discharge. But there's also high discharge at other times and we don't see masses of sawguy moving out. So it, it's unlikely that they're, that they're getting flushed out of the reservoir. Right? But, um, but it seems as discharge might be part of the story here. So when we, let me just go back to this for a minute. So, so discharge is part of the story. Clearly date is part of the story. And so we developed some candidate models to compare to see um, where we got the most support from the data. And we came up with the, t the top model, the two top models in the system. The first one, or one of them involved discharge and season. And the other included discharge, season, and the discharge by season interaction. So. When we look at the data in the models, we see this discharge on the x-axis, proportion of emigrating on the y-axis. We see that emigration increases with discharge in general, but it does so differently in different seasons. So in spring, we get this, uh, this big increase with discharge. In summer and uh, winter, we get a smaller increase. And in fall, we get very little increase with discharge. And the great thing is we have high discharge events in, all, in three of those seasons, and we see very different emigration probabilities. So we see that discharge is important, but season is, is equally important. <clears throat> OK. This is, uh, so we did the same thing for muscalunge, and we got the same results. The two top models were discharge and season, and discharge season and their interaction. And uh, so it looks, this, it's the qualitatively exactly the same as for walleye, I mean as for sogai. Emigration increased with increasing discharge. The seasons differed in the same order as they did with sogai. But the emigration probability for muscalunge is much, much less than for sogai. So if we put these on the same scale, you see this sogai on the left, musclinge on the right. And so even though they have the same qualitative pattern, the actual absolute level of immigration is really different for these two species. OK, so now we have, well, let me just, the couple take home. So most of the study, days in the study have no immigrants. Remember that. Only a few days of the two to three year study have emigration rates, immigration probabilities above 1% for, for sogai. And none of the days have that above 1% for musk lunge. So we've been able to characterize the patterns in immigration, when they emigrate, you know, what environmental conditions when they emigrate. But this doesn't seem like a big problem. Like they're not just all swimming out of the reservoir. So the next question is, so we have these patterns. What does it really mean for uh, loss of fish from the reservoir fishery? How does it relate to that? So we uh, took our best AIC models for each species. So we are using AIC model selection. So for each species, we had this probability of emigrating on a particular day. As a fun we described it as a function of discharge on that day and season. We applied these daily probabilities to daily discharge data from previous years in Allen Creek Lake to estimate the proportion of the population that's emigrating a given year, just based solely on the discharge and season. How, what proportion of the population do we estimate would emigrate in these previous years? And then we compared these emigration estimates to annual reductions in cohort densities in that year. So, so if you're following a cohort through time, it declines, right, a survivorship curve. And so what we did was take this annual increment of decline of each cohort and relate that to our estimates of 
uh, emigration proportions based on just based on discharge and in season. Sum that up for a year, and then and then asked whether these two things were correlated. So the estimates are annual reductions in cohort abundance. For SAWGUY, these are fishery independent surveys. They're annual gillnet fall surveys. We had data from 2006 to 2018. So we estimated the change in catch per unit effort in each cohort in each year that they were in the system. OK, so that's, that's nice. For muscalunge, we don't have fishery independent surveys. So with muscalunge, so here's reason number two, I love working with the Division of Wildlife. We have known angler catch surveys. Maybe this isn't news to anybody in here, I don't know. It was news to me, despite the fact that I've been working on fisheries in Ohio for a long time. So muscalunge, it's the first time I've worked on muscalunge. So muscalunge anglers, um, I did know this, that they're a special breed of people. Um, and, and so the state has set up this musky log, this angling log that people who fish regularly for muskies, they log in, they log their effort, they log where they've been fishing, they log in a lot of stuff. But we can then follow, they can then follow known anglers. They know their effort, they know their catch. And so it's not so, so creel surveys, traditional creel surveys have all sorts of unaccounted for variation. And this reduces a lot of that variation. And it gives a really nice estimate of of how um, of catch per unit effort. So we estimate change in known angler catch per effort over a given year instead of having fishery independent estimates of that same thing. Uh, through some model selection stuff, we consider juveniles and adults separately. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you then on the x-axis will be our estimated annual emigration probability based only on discharge in, in each of these years. And then the annual reduction in log in this case catch per effort. <clears throat> so this is for sawgye. First of all, the sub-adult line at the top shows no relationship between these two things. Not surprising, uh, sub-adult sawgye did not move out of the reservoir. Okay, adult sawgye, however, <clears throat> we, see a pot, or a, we see a negative, a, a correlation between our estimate of how many, what proportion the population is leaving and the change in the catch rate. So the more we say are leaving, the larger decline in a catch rate. And um, so that's one thing. So, and the next thing is we see in some years, there's the potential for a lot of saw a large portion of the saw guy to be leaving the reservoir. So, you know, a quarter of the saw guy leaving the res reservoir. That's a lot. That, that, I mean, that's a lot when I'm thinking about the downstream consequences. And that's a lot when I'm thinking about the upstream, the reservoir consequences. So, um, so yes, this level of, of emigration that we're, that we're predicting just based on discharge and season is enough to have a measurable impact on the fishery. When we look at muscalunge, we see the same thing, except in this case, we also see it for sub-adults. And um, in this case, we don't see such high levels of immigration. But remember, these cohorts live for over 20 years, and so you know, year after year, we may lose large portions of a cohort over, you know, many years. <clears throat> so, kind of conclusion from this is that while the dam may present a barrier to move from, from the reservoirs on many and even most days, when conditions are right, that is the right season with the right discharge, escapement can be significant and can present a significant loss to the fishery. Okay. So I'm going, to, I'm going to stop there with this study, and I'm going to move on to the next study. So this is where we think uh, dam barriers are good. <laughs> this is where we think they're bad. So now I'm going to talk about Atlantic salmon. So uh, this study, this model, was based on data from the Connecticut River. We developed the model to be a general consideration of salmon uh, my, downstream migration in just a, any large river. The data, however, the, the funding, however, came to study in the, in the Connecticut River, and uh, the data come from the Connecticut River. Okay, so smolts, so the, the salmon, they spend their adult life in the ocean, they uh, then swim upstream, and they swim into uh, tributaries off the main stem, and they spawn, they put their eggs there, the eggs hatch, the larvae turn into juveniles, the juveniles spend a couple of years there, and then uh, they swim back down to the ocean, and, uh, and they mature, and they uh, spend time years in the ocean. Okay, 
that period between the juveniles and the tributaries and getting downstream at the smolt phase. And the smolts are well adapted for moving quickly through, through rivers and making a quick physiological transition from fresh water to salt water when they get down at the end. <clears throat> okay, so we're studying the smolt phase. This is a map of dams on the Connecticut River. So dams are a problem here. Um, and uh, most of these are tributary dams, but there's also a number of main stem dams in there, and those are the ones we were talking about today. And so to deal with this problem, uh, for many years, <clears throat> the uh, agencies did this. They stocked juveniles above the dams. So they would collect the few adults that returned from the ocean each year, take them to hatcheries and spawn them, and then grow them up to be juveniles, and then stock the juveniles into these <coughs> reservoirs. And so they uh, created this big genetic mix of, of juveniles in, in, these, in these, not the reservoirs, into these tributaries, I mean. Okay. So one of the things that we started out studying in, in this system was, we, our question was, what are the consequences of the loss of local adaptations in the timing of migration? So if we just go back to this picture, and you think about a fish uh, migrating downstream from this position, which may be, that may be 500 kilometers above the, above the mouth of the river, versus a fish migrating from this position, which is about 25 kilometers above the mouth of the river, you can imagine it's not, so they might be, have to leave at a different time to make that a successful migration. And so our concern was when you put in this genetic mix of individuals across all the different tributaries, um, you're losing that potential for local adaptation to be, to be working. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the background of this. That's not the main point of what I'm going to talk about today. You just have to get through that to get to the main point, which is the consequences of dams. And then once we uh, look at the consequences of dams, uh, looking more closely at why the dams are having the effect that they're having. <clears throat> so this is a map of the eight tributaries and five dams that we were studying. There's actually six dams on there, but our, our, our modeled reach stops right before the upper dam. When I talk about this later in the talk, uh, I'm going to have the cartoon version. Right? And uh, I'm going to talk specifically, I'll show you specifically results from the Wells River tributary. So these are the, these are uh, smolts that are starting 428 kilometers upstream. The West River smolts are starting 241 kilometers upstream, so, you know, almost halfway down. And then these Salmon River uh, smolts. And not only are they close to the Long Island Sound, that is the mouth of the river and their destination, but they also have no dams in between their tributary and, and the mouth. Okay, so we start with a river model. This is just a spatially explicit temperature and flow template across the, the model period. So the model goes from April 1 through June. This is the smolt migration period. Um, and we uh, build these maps that uh, just characterize the, a coarse spatial representation of temperature and a temporal representation of, of temperatures. 10 years of data, 1993 to 2002, from a variety of sources. The collection of data was by far the most time-consuming part of this project. It's amazing how, how few, I, I've been amazed at this in Lake Erie too. People don't measure, temp, people don't monitor temperature in water bodies for whatever reason. Okay, so this is an example of two years, 2002, 1995. You know, we can see these general patterns. It gets warmer as the season progresses. It gets warmer as you move from upstream to downstream. But in other respects, these two years are pretty different. So um, late in the season, 1995 has much warmer upstream temperatures than early in the season, right? So now we also looked at temperature and we looked at flow. So this is current speed in those same two years. And you can see in 2002 we have these, you know, uh, flashy periods of, of current flow, clearly some precipitation events happening. In 1995, we're getting none of that. And so what we discovered was when we looked at the combination of temperature patterns and current flow um, for each year, each of the 10 years looked remarkably different from each of the other 10 years. And, and so, uh, you know, it, we had lots of variation to be working with in this model. That was both good and bad. Okay, so on top of that 
river template, that temperature flow template, we then had a smolt simulation. We had the smolts leaving their tributary on or around the stochastic process, some trigger temperature. And, and by trigger temperature, I mean the, the Q, the temperature Q that would trigger the beginning of the movement downstream. <clears throat> so we think this, you know, I guess the literature says this might be eight to 10 degrees, but what we really wanted was for the model to tell us what this temperature should be. And so we simulated a range of two degrees, way too cold, 15 degrees, way too warm. We knew that those were unreasonable extremes. And we wanted the model to tell us what, what would be a good time for migration um, in these model fish. Uh, then the, the rest of these uh, assumptions and parameters are all based on literature values, the kind of specifics that we don't need to be looking at. Temperature dependent daily survival. Okay, increased mortality at dams. We assume that they're going to die at dams. They die at, we think they die in a number of different ways at dams. Uh, depending on how they get through the dams, they might die by that passage itself. Uh, we also know that large predators congregate in, below these dams, and so predation is a, a potentially big effect. We um, also know that they're now in this big lake above the dam, which potentially also could have predators. So based on uh, a bunch of reasoning and literature values, we, uh, the, the simulations I'll be showing you use 2.5%. We don't think this is unreasonably high, let's <laughs> just say. Um, then delay at dams. If you look at the literature, you can see delays anywhere from a couple hours to, to six weeks. Um, so we used, and it depends on the dam structure, it depends on all sorts of things. Um, we used a range of delays at dam from zero to eight days. Again, we don't think these are unreasonably high levels to be thinking about. Okay, so this is what the results are going to look like. I've got this cartoon of the river over here. I'm showing you results from the West River smolts at river climber 241. This on the x-axis is the temperature trigger, the Q, that in an in individual simulation, the fish are using to leave their tributary. And the y-axis is a percent survival. This is a no-dam system. Um, so it's a simulation, right? So we can just take out the dams. <laughs> um, and this is mean conditions for, for all 10 years. And so what we can see is that there's a range of temperatures that they can be leaving the system where they get you know, really high survival. And so we just need to come up with some response that we could compare among different simulations. And so we just chose, we decided to look at the temperatures that allowed 75% survival of these downstream migrants. And so in this case, uh, that's a really broad range of temp temperatures, 4 to 12 degrees. They can leave any time they want. There's no fine uh, temperature uh, precision they need here. If we take this exact same uh, tributary, but now instead of looking at the mean conditions, still we've got no dams. So now we look at all 10 years, we see a lot more variation, of course, which is not surprising. And we see we have to slightly narrow our band of, of good temperatures, so 6 to 11 or so. Um, but still, there's this range of temperatures that they can leave. And, and across 10 years anyway, they can be guaranteed a pretty high survival. So next, I'm going to um, look at the Wells River, which is farther upstream, the same kind of graph but for the Wells River. <clears throat> and what we see is a lot more variation, slightly lower survival. But there's still this range of temperatures that will pretty much ensure they have high survival over all these years, even though these years are all so different from each other. And now I'm going to add on, we just looked at the West River, and now this is the Wells River. Now I'm going to add on the Salmon River, the downstream river. <clears throat> and we see the Salmon River, those fish can leave any time they want, and they can be successful. This doesn't have anything to do with what happens once they get into Long Island Sound. That's a separate piece. This is just getting through the river. <clears throat> And what we can also see is that there's actually, you know, a temperature, a, a narrow temperature range that it doesn't matter, you know, where they start, they, they can probably do pretty well, this is with no dams, by leaving at that temperature range. So in theory, if we continue mixing this thing genetically and throwing out these fish into all the tributaries over a really, really, really long time, they may adapt 
without any kind of local adaptation, but to a reasonable temperature for leaving the, the, um, the tributaries. Uh, the two problems with that is we don't have that much time. And, and two, there's no dams in here yet. So now I'm going to start adding dams. <clears throat> OK. So we just looked at this side, the left panel. That's with no dams. Now we want to look at a 2.5% mortality at dams plus a two-day delay at dams. Um, a two-day delay on, these, on this large river with these big dams that make these multi-kilometer reservoirs behind them is, you know, we don't know for sure, but we're pretty confident that it's not an overestimate of the delays. Okay, so what we see is in general, so we're way upstream, survival rates go down, number one. There's lots of variation across years, and there is no range of temperatures that will ensure that they have high survival, no range of leaving temperatures that ensure high survival. Midstream or mid-river, um, again, you get a general decline in survival rates, lots of variation, and no range of temperatures that will guarantee high survival. Downstream, it should not look any different with dams and without dams because there are no dams that far downstream. All right, so we're seeing this is a two-day delay dam. I'm going to show you four-day delay. Uh, it looks very similar, except that these these uh, survivals have declined even more uh, for both the Wells and the West River. <clears throat> so I, um, I just want to look at this in a slightly different way, uh, looking at survival <coughs> frequency distribution for each of these three tributaries. And so I, it's a very specific set of parameter values here, but at, when there's no dams, um, you get pretty high survival in all, all three streams. These are all leaving at the 7.5 degree trigger temperature. You add a half day delay at dams, and now, just with a simple delay like this, you, these are 100 simulations, you get you know, five cases, five years, where there's complete cohort um, collapse. And so even with this little delay at dams, you have a big effect from those fi on those fish that are coming from way upstream. Two-day delayed dams is going to go just like you would expect, right? It gets worse and worse the longer you get delayed dams. Okay, but <clears throat> so we made a model, and we said when fish run into a dam, they're going to die, right? They've got this 2.5% mortality. And so we run the simulations, and we discover when fish run into dams, they die. Well, of course, we told them they had to, right? So that's the, the issue with models. You tell them to do something, and they do it. The problem is, and so we knew that was going to happen. That was just the beginning. We just need to set this, this um, baseline so that we can start doing some other things with the model. But we got to this baseline, and we didn't really understand it. So fish are dying at a 2.5% per dam um, rate, and they have this they're, these fish in the blue are going through five dams. And so, you know, we're not expecting 100% of them to die with a 2.5% mortality at each of five dams. And so there's something else going on here than just this direct dying at dams. And so to, to figure that out, <clears throat> we started looking at some trajectories of where fish are going. So this is April through June downstream to upstream. These little very light gray bars, gray lines, those are dams. We're looking at fish. Oh, and the colors are temperature. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why I don't have a scale of temperature on here, but it goes from cooler to warmer. Uh, these fish that we're going to show you are just 10 fish leaving the West River, and they're leaving at 10 degrees. Okay, and you can look at their, tra their trajectories, and some of them are on top of each other, but all of them make it out with these 10 fish. They all happen to make it out. There are no dams in the simulation. Even though I've got the dams in the picture, the, um, there are no dams in the simulation. So now we're going to add dams. OK, so we add dams. And you can see this, is a, this simulation has a four-day delay at dams. So it's a stochastic thing. So it can be laid anywhere from 0 to whatever um, <clears throat> with an exponential delay at dams. And uh, so we can see those delays. and. We can also see that when they're at the dams, in this case, of these 10 fish, two of them actually died at the dams. But 
That's not the interesting part. The interesting part is this. There's four fish here that successfully passed one, two, three dams and then died after they passed those dams. And so I know this is just one example, but this is what we saw over and over in these stochastic runs of, this, of these models with different parameter values. And what's happening is the fish get delayed at dams, and the longer they get delayed, the higher the likelihood is that they're going to run into one of these hot spots in, later in the season. So these hot spots happen sort of these hot spots, which I, I think of as temporal spatial spots, right, of hot water. Um, happen more frequently late in the season, but their timing is a little bit stochastic. In fact, this fish was delayed so long that it missed the hot spot. It went in that little area, that little time space where there was no hot spot, and so it made it out. So there's a stochasticity to it, but there's also an increase in likelihood of hitting one of these spots or hitting water that's too warm the longer they're delayed. So. The delay at dams combined with this kind of unpredictable, I mean, it's predictable in that it gets more common the, the, the longer you go in the season. Patterns of warming downstream increases the likelihood that smolts will end up in water that's too warm. So it disrupts this match between the completion of the migration and this window of uh, conditions where it's appropriate for migration. So it isn't so much what's happening at the dam it's what the delay at the dam causes to happen later. <clears throat> okay, caribou. I almost forgot about the caribou. So we think this has implications beyond Atlantic salmon smolts moving downstream in the Connecticut River. This concept of barriers to movement and the barriers causing delays, we think is a general a concept that needs to be considered. So this is the caribou migration, this is a crossing a pipeline in Alaska. So the oil companies um, aware that there's a barrier caused by these pipelines have built bridges. And these bridges allow successful passage. And this is, I love this picture because it shows these caribou are coming in from all over and they're successfully passing this barrier. So if you're interested in, you know, barriers or, or whatever it is, something as a barrier, you know, you can check that box. You've successful passage is happening here. But you have to ask the next question. So what is the, the energetic and the time cost of having to use this barrier? Of course, it's good that there's, I'm having to use this passage. Of course, it's good that there's a passage, but there's more to it than just successfully passing. There's lots of other examples too, too. For example, this is a, a passage in Florida to allow wildlife to get past this highway without getting hit. And uh, I think this is the one that was really inspired by turtle migration. And so it's successful that wildlife uses it and successfully passes. But again, you have to ask that, you know, at what energetic and what time cost? What's the ultimate cost of having to use this specific passage uh, by the wildlife? So uh, we're not going to talk about bubble curtains, though they are cool. <laughs> um, so I got these two studies. They're very different, right? And I didn't, and I didn't only recently realize in what ways they are very similar. And so what have I learned from them? I've already told you there's not going to be any big general ecological conclusion <laughs> here. But I, it's, it, it has come down for me to be, it's all uh, kind of a matter of perspective. So... I study sawgai and muscalunge, but I'm mostly concerned about sawgai moving downstream into these little creeks. I, and, and, um, and these dams seem like uh, really, they're really holy barriers, right? They're not very good barriers to this downstream movement. A lot of these fish are moving downstream. In some years, it looks like maybe a quarter of the fish are moving downstream. So that's that makes me think that dams are not very good barriers. So now we take dams in, on the Connecticut River, and the Connecticut River is huge. There's so much water moving through that. And these dams, they've made all sorts of special passage you know, technologies to, to allow fish and to try to attract fish to get them to go downstream. Right? So if dams that are made as barriers aren't good barriers, then these dams that are made 
to have passage through them, you know, what, there must not be any problem at all for fish moving downstream. And so, you know, it turns out that more fish in the Ohio reservoirs are moving downstream than I ever expected, on the one hand. On the other hand, we don't really know how many fish are getting through the passageways on the Connecticut River, but even if those passageways are very successful, that is a lot of fish are able to make that passage, the consequences of the delay of passage may be much more lethal, or at least as lethal, as the, the barrier itself. And so, so by combining these studies, I feel like I, I'm sort of thinking about my biases going into these, what I think is going to be a, you know, a, bad, a bad effect or a really strong negative effect versus a strong positive effect, and thinking about why I think of these things differently in these two systems. And I think it's come down to fish can move downstream past dams, through dams, but there's consequences of, of that delay of doing so. So anyway, I'd be glad to take questions, and uh, if somebody sees some big general ecological theory that's coming out of this, let me know. <laughs> okay, I'm done. We have a few minutes for questions. Okay. Well, yeah. What is the bubble curtain? <laughs> bubble curtain. <laughs> So it also turns out that there's a lot of technologies used to guide fish to keep them from moving places. And the same technologies are used to guide fish to get them to move places. And so a bubble curtain is one of these things I'm fascinated with that, that people have used to not only, not only uh, corral fish, but also to uh, keep uh, other things that, that exist in bodies of water you know, like debris from going into, you know, intake valves or something. And so these bubble curtains are fascinating. Uh, you know, we're, <laughs> we're trying to sell this idea in Ohio reservoirs. I don't think we're going to go very far, but I think it's fascinating. But they're used to keep fish from going places and to encourage fish to go places. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any suggestions, or does ODNR have any plans to try to increase the retention rate of sawgai or muskie in reservoirs? Like, what's the solution to that? Yeah, so uh, the sawgai, um, so the, you know, it's hard to know. I mean, the muskie are moving enough that it's causing a, a reduction in, you know, measurable re reduction in the fishery. They're not moving nearly as much as the sawgai. Uh, so the sawgai seems to be the bigger of the two problems, plus the consequences of sawgai, muskie are native, you know, they live in the rivers. Uh, some of these reservoirs where they've been stocked have spawning populations, so it's another potential goal of stocking is to get spawning populations. Okay, anyway, so the sawgai, one of the things you can imagine doing is not letting out so much water in these certain seasons. And so that's possible in some of the reservoirs. Uh, in this particular reservoir, it's not. Uh, well, there may be some subtleties we could uh, encourage, but it's a flood control reservoir, so all the water coming in and out, they don't really care about sawgai. It's an Army Corps of Engineers uh, reservoir, and they don't, keeping sawgai in is not one of their high priorities. It's just like, so, so I think there are, uh, there's dams on, the different dams across Ohio uh, were built for different purposes. A lot of it was for recreation, some of it's for flood control, some of it's for water supply, building water supply reservoirs. And so the different dams, uh, I think we could have different ability to affect how they manage it. And this one, maybe not. And so it's not clear. One of the things that happens in some of these places is a big tailwater fishery starts. And so if we, so these, these are actually underestimates of migration because they have to go through the tailwaters first before they get detected. So if we can encourage tailwater fisheries to remove this fish, you know, at, that adds a new fishery, it, it, it's kind of a different style of fishing than fishing in, in the reservoir in a boat. Um, and so it encourages a new fishery and maybe reduces the number of fish that ultimately get into the stream. That is a fantastic question. Um, I don't know. Uh, 
these sagai grow really fast in general. That's why they stock them. Um, they're, I'm trying to think if we are seeing any growth reductions over the years. We see so, there's some straw reductions in survival over the years of stocking in a reservoir that we thought may have something to do with density of older classes. But I haven't really thought about the growth reductions. That's, a, that's something we can look at. That's a great idea. The questions? Yeah. Kind of shifting over to the kinetic Uh-huh. Uh huh. Fish. I mean, they try to get fish by. Yeah. I, I mean, so our simulation, we really tried to err on the conservative side, because uh, <laughs> it, it's really easy to kill, kill fish in a simulation if you you know put in um, that they're going to die at, at the dams. Uh, we think we think our passage rates are probably. We don't know. We don't know, really. <laughs> when people do studies where they stick fish in above the dam and measure how many pass, you know, they get some certain estimates of a passage. And those are, are way over estimates of passage, because that's, that's a tricky part of getting them through the dam or over or around the dam. It is a tricky part, but it's at least as tricky to get them from the top of the reservoir down to that, those structures. So yeah, we believe that they pass dams. But even if they pass dams, that's not enough. Still yeah. That that's right. They still have to get to the, the point where um, they've still got to get downstream before the conditions get inhospitable for them. Yeah. There's not much of a management. What do the managers think about that? Is there anything they thought of that can increase yeah. Capacity yeah. They they're working on those those things constantly. They're working constantly on on downstream passage and um, how to improve that. How to attract fish. Bubble curtains, <laughs> I think, are the answer. But um, they also in the Connecticut River have ended the restoration program. So uh, it was unsuccessful, and. Uh, it was, you know, very expensive. Um, I think that would be. I think that was reason enough. I think they're probably considering it when um, the hurricane that hit New York City, uh, Sandy, took out one of the major hatcheries. So rebuilding that would have been this extra, you know, a lot more expense. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. That's officially a reason that they did it, but that seemed like. A good reason. I wasn't being very successful, so they've they've given they they've stopped the restoration program. But there's a lot of other fish that need downstream passage. Um, a lot of other anatomist fish, American shad, for instance, that I didn't talk about that need downstream passage at a different life stage. So they need it. Well, they need it at the larval stage as well as the juvenile stage. And so those are kind of slightly different. Um, uh, I guess concerns or, or, or things that have to be dealt with when you're thinking about how to get that passage. So I think each, each species is slightly different. It's a, it's a really hard problem. And they, these are not dams that are going to be removed, you know. <laughs> yeah. The questions? Okay. Instead of the usual social that usually happens at Nick's at 5, we're actually going to move a little bit further from campus and go to the smoking pit at 5 30. So Libby can get some delicious stuff here in town. Um, so if you guys want to go to Southern Pig, I encourage you to. We'll try to get a big table so folks can join us just like at Nick's. Um, for those of you that don't know where it is, it's just down 76. Check it out on Google. Uh, we're going to aim to be there about 5 30. So get some of there. Thanks.